tell us about the NPA. So what is the mandate of the NPA? What are you supposed to do? Why do we have NPA? Because we have... Tor is not a regulator. Boss no. is not a regulator. Yes. So NPA is supposed to be the boss of all these institutions. That is so. But you're under the ministry. That is so. Tell us what your mandate is. So the mandate of the NPA is to regulate, oversee, and um, more or less monitor the downstream industry as far as some specific product is concerned. For education and purposes, downstream? Downstream, so I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. But I'll just give you the mandate, the, the, the raw mandate. So first of all, so we deal with crude oil, petrol, diesel, kerosene, LPG, um, aviation fuel, bitumen, um, premix, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. we regulate that space. As far as importation, exportation, production, refining, processing, transportation, pipeline, construction, construction of depots, construction of um, um, offshore mooring facility and jetties, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a very broad mandate that we have as far as the downstream industry. So you can't sell petroleum product without getting a license I from see. the NPA. You can't import without getting a license from the MPA. You can't set up any infrastructure without getting a construction permit from the MPA, for instance. So basically, that is the broad mandate. Including the ones that do the... I think the people the even, Gao Gao, they yeah, call them the like Gao Gao. So mm. Gao Gao, yes, so all of them, we give them time for them to, you know, transition into the, the full-time regulatory environment. It's not as regular as I've seen in other countries, but in the northern part, we have tabletop fuel sellers where they load petrol in a bottle and sell. Is that something that you approve of? We do not really approve of that, but there is a limit to which we can approve. When you are dealing with petroleum products less than a certain quantity, okay. it is permitted. Because the law is not um, a, a very inflexible so as to punish people. There are some areas where you do not have um, uh, retail outlets, so you don't have filling stations. Some of these people are the ones that service those areas. Okay. Now, in the absence of these people, those people will be cut off from the supply of petroleum products. So what we're doing is, instead of um, demonizing them, we rather bring them um, on stream but it's in not order dangerous. to be able to regulate them. Is it not dangerous selling petrol like it was pure water on a table? Yes, it's extremely dangerous. Anything that has to do with petroleum products is considered dangerous, regardless of the quantity. So what we do is we regulate them. We give them some minimum um, um, standard operating uh, performance that they have to adhere to. And every now and again, our inspectors are on the road to monitor and see whether they are conforming to the standards that we have given to them. Is it the job of the NPA to ensure fuel stations are scattered around the country or you're just supposed to license OMCs and let them do what they have to do? So we grant licenses to the OMCs and then the OMCs would now go and get their stations. We have um, citing regulations. So you can't cite the petroleum um, outlets within a certain distance so we take into consideration the nearness of the station to uh, an area where you find a lot of population activity so religious activity area for instance the mosque or church we regulate the distance between which you site a market school and normally we also even regulate where there is a cave so that people will be able to see whatever is happening around that place. And then there is a minimum distance between one station and the other. Now, if you have checked in the past, you have stations that are stationed back to back to each other. Post June 2015, the regulations were changed. And then we started now giving sighting uh, permits for petroleum products for petrol diesel 500 meters, and when LPG is concerned, we'll make it 1,000 meters, more or less one kilometer. Apart. That is right. Is it in the case of the same brand, or even if they are different brands? Even if they are different, different, different OMCs. But I've seen 
say, and I'm going to use, just use these names randomly, there's a shell across the road and there's a girl across the road, or yes. the road goes between the shell and the girl. That's not 500 meters. That, those are stations which were in existence before the regulations came okay. in. And if you have checked our laws, our laws don't take retrospective effects, mm -hmm. so it can only take prospective effects. Mm -hmm. So those mm -hmm. existing stations will continue to remain. And the idea at the time, which predates me, was that all those who have procured permits to put up stations before the coming into effect of the new regulations would continue to enjoy the fruits of that permits that they, okay. they, they, they got. Okay. So some of them are still even putting up their stations. So somebody may not understand, but why is this station coming up? At the time, it was understood that mm. if you have procured permits, mm. irrespective of the fact that you do not have the, the funds to be able to put up your station, mm. you still are allowed to, to proceed. So the MPA states, do you think that uh, we have GOIL, it's partly state, isn't it? But mm. do you think the state should be involved in deploying fewer stations to these areas I talked about? For instance, what I've talked about is between Boko and uh, Zebila. I have seen fewer on tabletops, and I'm sure there will be more in other places. So if the state realizes that there's no fewer station, let's, let's build one there. Is that something you think should work? Yeah, following the directly, I mean, so f this is what has been happening before. There has been a progressive removal of states in as far as the retail of petroleum products is concerned and the story. So we move from commodity deregulation to price deregulation. One of the days when the state used to import petroleum products to sell to Ghanaians, mm -hmm. and if we recall at the time when uh, Professor Kosi Botwe was the finance minister. Any time that he read the budget, he would announce the price of petroleum products. Those were the days that the state had full control. Mm -hmm. So commodity was controlled by the state. So GMPC used to procure and import petroleum products on behalf of the state mm -hmm. to distribute to uh, mm -hmm. various OMCs and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Now that changed. And then we now came to price deregulation. But at some point, the state still took interest and the price of the products so that the state subsidized the price of the products and with the subsidy came instances where the state defaulted in paying the subsidies because of competing interests from other sectors of the economy now that had a tendency and it really did more or less led to some collapse of some you know institutions mm -hmm. some bdc's collapse some banks also suffered the same situation and so in july 2015 price deregulation was fully rolled out where the government no longer was responsible for subsidy consumers will pay the full price of petroleum products depending on the price on the international market foreign exchange rates and the taxes levies and margins on the price of petroleum mm -hmm. products mm -hmm. so now the state does not get involved in anything unless maybe the state the state decides to take shares in any of the private companies. And of course, the only company that the state has any interest in, I think, is, is Coil. Well, the rest of it is... Um, fuel smuggling is a big problem. We are told over 200 million cities is lost to the state every year. I believe that's, again, your mandate. You're supposed to prevent people from, from so. smuggling fuel. What have you done so far since you became CEO of NPA? So, the, um, it's, it's been... So, like, like you rightly said from the beginning, I have worked in the industry and then... Um, I was a member of the Manifesto Committee, um, subcommittee for energy 2016. during the 2016 elections. And so we worked on a lot of those um, information regarding smuggling of petroleum products. And especially in 2016, there was some heavy amount of smuggling of petroleum products uh, post the deregulation of pricing. Now, what really triggered my interest was when I checked the data for exports for instance in 2015 we exported nearly 10 million liters of petroleum products to the neighboring landlocked countries in 2016 we exported 180 million liters now, I felt that was mathematically impossible for us to move about 1800 percent so then you have to now interrogate those figures now, if we say we exported to Mali, then I took a trip to Mali, uh, led by the um, Honorable Kujo, Deputy Minister. So he led us to Mali to meet the regulators in Mali to ascertain whether or not 
this amount of product are said to have left Ghana to Came Mali. To you. Did it come? Uh, to our amazement, they said that trucks with Ghanaian registered registration are not even permitted to go to Mali. Serious? And all these trucks purportedly loaded from Ghana to Mali. And would this be product that was imported originally by Malians or was imported by Ghana and exported to Mali? Which one is? What, so they are they? imported into Ghana by Ghanaian by companies. Ghanaians. And they are selling to their counterparts in Mali. So because we have the port, Precisely. they import. They import. Then they say to you that, well, give us permit, we are traveling across. And that, they, they put it in a tanker and they are moving it to Mali or Burkina or Niger or wherever. So that's what happens with Burkina Faso. In Burkina Faso, only one company is permitted to import products into Burkina Faso, and that's a state-owned company called Sonabi. Okay. Now, Sonabi would also get the Lakan. Lakan is the schedule that we give for um, companies to, to import petroleum products mm -hmm. into the country, mm -hmm. allocation at the ports. So Mali would normally, uh, Burkina Faso would normally get a Lakan, or sometimes they buy from um, BDCs and then export to their country. They also don't permit Ghanaian trucks to go to Burkina Faso. Now, on record, we found out that there were a lot of Ghanaian trucks that had been loaded purportedly to these countries. Just in for Burkina Faso Precisely. and Mali. So clearly, these companies did not export the petroleum products to those countries. Where they, does it go to? So they dump in the country because there is um, an incentive. And the incentive is a tax that you won't be paying. Export products don't attract taxes. So if you say you are loading for export and you dump, then you get to pocket the export component, so you uh, could the, take, the, the tax component. So practically, you take fuel from Tor and say you're sending it to Mali. Mm -hmm. Then you go and sell it at Ashaiman. Exactly. Oh. That is practically how it happens. So it means we consume all what we claim we are exporting. So we consume. But does that not then mean that our supply for our own country is less? Otherwise, if our supply was adequate, I mean, there wouldn't be the need for people to buy from illegal people. What happens is that the officially recorded volumes in the country will be reduced because we have smuggled products coming into the country. A typical example is year, year on year, um, we normally have at least 5% increase in the volumes that we consume in the previous year. Now, in 2016, we consumed 5% less than we did in 2015. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. In 2016, it was an election year. All these vehicles crisscrossing the country, you know, are supposed to have even increased the volumes that we would have consumed. By the end of the year, we found out that we had consumed less 5%. And that was also a trigger that will keep everybody on inquiry to ascertain whether or not there's something that's going on that we don't know. So in the case of Mali and Burkina, like you stated, yeah. what new measures have you introduced to prevent this from happening in the future? So what we did was to now streamline the export regime. And when we did, we are now supposed to provide us a contract that you have with the importer in the country mm -hmm. that you are exporting to. Mm -hmm. You notarize that contract, and so you apply for what you call a no objection. You attach all the contracts that you have. Then we will ask the Malians to give us a, 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 a what's the name, a database of vehicles registered in Mali, so that when the vehicles are sent down, we will cross check to see. So you will not allow a Ghanaian tanker to send it. It no, has to be brought. It has by to be brought by the Malians. Okay. okay. And we need to have the details of those trucks. So what happened some time ago was that you had Ghanaian companies having some vehicles that had Malian registration numbers. They loaded at the depot, left the depot straight to another depot, removed the number plates, and then put Ghanaian number plates. And we caught them in the act, and an action had been taken against them. GRA had to intervene, and then the vehicles were confiscated. I believe they are still in the process of auctioning them. So basically, those are the things that happened. So we've changed completely the export regime. And things that were done, uh, 180 million liters now came down to about 5 million Wow. Latest. Wow. And that is saving the state a lot of money as far so as. So you're saying to uh, me that if I'm at the Paga border 
and I see a fuel tanker with Ghana registration number crossing, that's an illegality. That's a complete illegality. It must um, not happen. No, but you can do citizen arrest. That is complete illegality. And if I see a Burkina Bay or a Malian registered tanker entering Ghana, that one should be fair. And if that it's going one, out with fuel, that would mean that you would have done all the necessary documentation. That one um, is a rebuttable presumption. Rebuttable presumption in the sense that you would assume that it had gone through all the necessary processes. But we are obligated um, by virtue of being a coastal country to support the landlocked countries under the Ecuador's protocols mm. for them to be able to have easy access to products. the coast. Mm. So but that's I, I, are you not playing the ostrich? I, I have traveled between, between Navrongo and the border, and I've traveled between Boko and the border. I've cited over 20 fuel stations. And these are recognized state fuel stations, or st fuel stations that are licensed by Ghana. Mm -hmm. And they are back to back. I mean, you've said 500 meters, but this should be even like a meter apart. And the number of vehicles I saw on that stretch, we spent like 10 minutes, we were the only car on that road. Who are they servicing? We know who they are. It's Burkina Faso they are servicing. That's in Togo. That's smuggling happening right under your nose, and you're seeing it. Go back and check whether those stations are still working. You've closed them. I mean, nobody will close them. You don't get, when you don't get the supply, naturally you will close. But they work at night. That's what I've been told by community members. You can send a team. See no. whether they still receive the products. Send a team. I mean, we have checked. They are about, the last stretch between um, Navrongo, uh, when you make the last 10, the last fast stretch between Navrongo, you have more than almost 30 stations. Yes. A lot of them were set up between 2014, 2014, 2016. So all of them were cited around that time. It, well, there was an incentive to do so, so that you send the export products to those places. All right? Now, you don't get those export products anymore. Now, go back and check whether those stations but, are still operating. As, but but, but as is it not possible to. that someone could buy a product here in Ghana and say that um, they are selling it in Ghana? I believe there will be incentives for, for, for buying and selling in Ghana. And then they take it to these, these fuel stations over there, which serve as depots more than filling stations. And I'm told they use donkey carts to cut them into, into Togo and Burkina. You see, there has also to be uh, a comparison between the price in Ghana and price in Togo or Burkina Faso. If the prices in uh, Burkina Faso are cheaper than the price in Ghana, then there's no incentive for you to buy at high price and then go and sell at in Burkina Faso mm. at a cheaper price. So all those incentives have to be there do you get it what is now, the situation it, now now our prices are almost prices are almost the same i mean the difference between our price and togo and the Burkina faso is something negligible and you don't want to take the risk of going through all of these things and that is what it should be so if i send my correspondent to these fuel stations to spend a week there he will not see tankers coming to discharge you will see tankers coming to discharge because they have to discharge to those places. Mm -hmm. But the way and manner that they used to load, and you find all those stations working at the same time, you won't find it. That so way. the frequency is lower now? The frequency is lower. I mean, it's difficult, even in the United States and mm -hmm. all these developed countries, to stop you know, smuggling of petroleum products. We've been to um, uh, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, you go to mm -hmm. Korea. And all of them somehow still face some of these. Do you use a tracking system for that as well, or you do not? We use a lot of uh, mechanism to do that, and so we have what we call the electronic cargo uh, um, electronic cargo tracking system. Okay, that we put on vehicles that load from various depots to the retail outlets, so I can just switch to my system on this TV right now, and you can see, and I can monitor vehicle by vehicle i'm actually going to come back other. so you switched that and then tv I check yeah. let I me check who is going where who is okay. going and i can print your movement for you for the week for the month wherever you packed wherever you when when you started the engine and moved all of it we have it